Welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Bob Riley, your host. Today we're going to do something different. I'm privileged to have a conversation with an expert on the Soviet Union and on contemporary Russia. I speak of David Satter, who's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. I began reading David Satter 40 years ago when his brilliant pieces were appearing as op-eds in the Wall Street Journal, <clears throat> his writings in the Financial Times, National Review, and many other magazines, many of them written from the Soviet Union or Russia, from both of which he was expelled uh, because of the kind of things he was reporting on which made things uncomfortable for the Soviet Union and then for the authoritarian Russian government. Now David has written five spellbinding books on the Soviet Union and Russia. I'm just going to mention them very quickly. The first was Age of Delirium, The Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, on which he also made a prize-winning documentary film. Next, Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State. Then. It was a long time ago, and it never happened anyway, Russia and the communist past, which is an absolutely riveting look at how Russians cope or refuse to cope with the communist legacy. And since David was there and had this on the ground experience and got some dirt in his hands as he went to some of the former killing grounds of the Gulag, uh, it's, it's an indispensable book for anyone who wants to both understand the Soviet Union and why it's morphed into, in some respects, modern Russia today. The next book David wrote was The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep, Russia's Road to Terror and Dictatorship under Yeltsin and Putin. Now, most recently, uh, David has put out a collection of his writings over a span of 40 years uh, from some of the journals I mentioned. It includes interviews and uh, other kinds of writing he's done. It's called Never Speak to Strangers and Other Writing from Russia and the Soviet Union 1976 to 2019. I want to emphasize that in all of these writings show a depth of understanding, but are never academic dry as, dry as dust. They are, they are really dramas. They're dramas of investigation and discovery. Uh, and David is a brilliant writer, and these books are riveting. As I have been reading through his new book, I'm so happy to have the gems that I remember from so many years ago collected in one place that shows how prescient his understanding was at the time and how accurately he foretold what most likely was coming next. So much of what he wrote in this is still relevant today and that's why David I'm so happy to have you with the Westminster Institute. Thank you for coming. Well thank you Bob. I'm very glad to be here. Glad to uh, be engaged with you on this subject that is so important to to both of us and, uh, and I'm sure to, to many of our viewers. Uh, perhaps I can begin by talking a little bit about this most recent book because it brings together the articles that I've written in the course of more than 40 years. And those articles chronicled uh, not just the life of Russia and the Soviet Union, but in a way my life because I was so intimately connected with that part of the world and the events that took, took place there. There's a lot of personal drama in here. Absolutely, absolutely. In a way, this book is uh, a kind of intellectual diary or an intellectual chronicle. Uh, as I mentioned in the inter introduction, I was privileged to witness four different Russias. The Russia of Brezhnev, the Russia of Gorbachev, the Russia of Yeltsin and now the Russia of Putin. And 
those Russias were all quite different from each other, but at the same time, they're fundamentally the same. What was, uh, what, what links uh, these very different periods is a common attitude toward the individual, a common attitude toward the role of the state, a common attitude toward the necessary balance between uh, the dignity of the individual and the prerogatives of those who are in power. We, and it's in fact uh, the challenge for the future of Russia, at least in my opinion, to uh, develop a regime which will not be like uh, the four Russias that have preceded it. And one of the things that I've, I, I, I've tried to do with my work and what I'm trying to do now is, is suggest ways in which that could happen. Uh, I've devoted a lot of time and a lot of thought to what can be done exactly about a situation in which the individual is seen not as worthy of uh, respect f in his own right, but is regarded as raw material for the, for, for the deranged purposes of the state. Under the, under the Brezhnev regime, uh, the individual was a builder of communism. He didn't have identity of his own. He realized himself through his historic mission, of course, which was defined by others, which was to build communism in the Soviet Union and then to extend the blessings of communism to the whole world. And it was this deranged uh, idea that, that paradoxically gave a sense of meaning to what oftentimes were very deprived lives. People in the Soviet Union had few illusions about their standard of living, in fact. Uh, it was generally understood that the people in the West lived better than they did, that they lived worse than people in the West. But they compensated for that mentally with the idea that they had a great mission, that, they, that their lives had a purpose, that their country was capable of dominating uh, the world and, and, in fact, inspiring fear. I was... Uh, uh, constantly impressed by the extent to which Soviet people felt it was necessary to make other people afraid. Uh, it was a, a, ra a rather strange refrain uh, that uh, for a Westerner, of course, is quite surprising, uh, that, that uh, Soviet citizens said, well, you know, the world is afraid of us. And uh, they took that to be a very good thing because they, understood their country less as a, a nation which was organized to guarantee the welfare and freedom of its inhabitants, but as, a, a, as an organized messianic movement uh, in the form of, of, of a political entity, which uh, uh, existed not so much for uh, its own sake, but for the sake of its motivating idea. Well, when uh, Gorbachev came to power. He attempted to modernize this system, which had calcified and stagnated and, had show, and showed signs of, of slowing down and showed signs of not being uh, uh, able to compete militarily with the West. They understood that it couldn't compete economically, but that didn't bother them very much. But the signs that it couldn't compete militarily, that had them very worried. Uh, in 1981, there was an air battle over the Beka Valley in Lebanon in which Israeli jets using American and Israeli technology destroyed 81 Syrian MiG fighters, which of course were acquired from the Soviet Union without losing a single plane. Well, that resonated in the Kremlin. They, they, they realized that Western countries were on the verge of mastering the new phase of the scientific technical revolution and that their institutions were not capable of keeping up. That if there was going to be a new broad-based arms race, the Soviet Union was going to lose. Under those circumstances, they were motivated, and that was one of the motivations, but there were, there were others as well, uh, to uh, undertake reform. Those reforms, however, uh, went nowhere because they were based on the use of force, uh, uh, on authoritarian methods, 
uh, and they encountered the resistance of the party apparatus. Uh, Gorbachev himself was not able to reform anything. He, re he, he re relied on the party apparatus, on party officials at all levels, and if they decided to sabotage uh, his plans, uh, there was not very much he could do. And it was that dilemma that gave rise to Glasnost. But Glasnost was fatal for the ideology uh, because it opened up a sp the, 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 the idea was that if people were given a little bit of free information, a little bit of freedom to speak, a little bit of freedom to demonstrate, uh, it would put pressure on that recalcitrant party apparatus, which was getting, which was refusing to carry out uh, Gorbachev's reforms. Uh, but in fact, a little bit of information is hard to control because the, it inspires demands for more information, and this is what happened. Uh, the limits of Glasnost continually expanded until uh, the ideology, which was an entire false version of reality was in tatters. And uh, the uh, legitimacy of the regime was hopelessly undermined. This, a, a space had been created in a world of lies for uh, the ex expression and examination of the truth. And under those circumstances, uh, an, unre an unresolvable tension was created between the, re the, the real world and uh, the fictitious world that had long been imposed on, on rightless Soviet citizens. One or the other had to prevail. And all the f fault lines, the hidden fault lines in the Soviet Union, the national conflicts, the economic conflicts, even the conflicts within the party, because the party was a monolithic structure as long as there was no possibility of disagreement. But it was composed of people like any other human institution. And as soon as the disagreement became a practical possibility, the, you know, tensions within the party apparatus appeared. Uh, it all culminated in August 1991 with the coup attempt. Uh, which was staged by people who were trying to preserve the Soviet Union but, uh, and understood that Gorbachev's policies would inevitably lead to the country's collapse. Uh, their coup attempt was unsuccessful and the Soviet Union survived for four months after the coup failed and then it too became part of history. Gorbachev was replaced, or the Gorbachev regime was replaced, uh, uh, and Gorbachev's Russia, in effect, Gorbachev's Soviet Union, by Yeltsin and Yeltsin's Russia. Now, the ideology, and we have to go back to the ideology because this is very important for Americans to understand that there are countries that are based on ideologies. It is possible to have a regime based on an entire fictitious version of reality, and that our appreciation of reality and our uh, system, which is ultimately anchored in transcendent values, is not a given, that uh, there are places that, ca that uh, 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 absolutely uh, destroy the values of the West and establish their own anti-systems. That's what happened in the Soviet Union. Well, the, 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 the key aspect of that ideology was uh, a, a unique, not unique, but a, a uh, let's say in terms of the Western tradition, a dissenting uh, uh, understanding of the source of values. The, uh, the, in the West, as we know, we you know all of Western tradition is based on the on the assumption that tr tr that trans values are transcendent and they derive from a higher source, it's over and above the realm of, of society. Uh, the Soviet Union took the view 
and communist ideology took the view that it was society itself that was the source of values. Of course, that part of society which they felt was enlightened. Uh, so therefore, it, it was the interests of the working class that determined, the, that determined values. Right and wrong was uh, measured exclusively by what was in the interests of the working class, supposedly. Working class, in turn, was represented not by workers, but by a group of, of, of intellectuals who claimed to, to uh, speak for the workers. And that uh, group of intellectuals uh, was uh, organized into a structure which, which uh, made it possible to uh, rule on the basis of the will of a single person. The, um, the notion that values uh, come from society, uh, that they come from u human entities, was of course taken over by Nazi Germany. In the case of, of uh, r the Soviet Union, values originated, uh, were based on the interests of, this, uh, of, of the leading class. Uh, in Nazi Germany, it was the leading race, but the idea is the same. And uh, what was important was to reassert, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the primacy of universal, uh, universal transcendent values, the, the values that uh, Judeo-Christianity uh, established uh, for the Western world, and which uh, formed the, you know, the basis for societies uh, that acknowledge uh, the rule of law and that are based on the rule of law. Well, unfortunately, it would have thought that that was a, an inevitable and logical next step, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, of course, those people who called themselves young reformers, they paid lip service to the importance of establishing the authority of universal values. But all of their actions demonstrated that they retained a communist frame of reference. In particular, they, they, they took the view, from, which is fundamental to Marxist thought, that uh, all uh, spiritual institutions ultimately uh, d derive and, and, and all political institutions as well, ultimately derive from economic uh, relations. Marx held that um, socialism is the uh, abolition of private property. Well, they simply turned that on their heads, and they were trained as Marxists, by the way. Even though they, uh, they, 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 they said they were free market radicals, much of their approach uh, continued to be Marxist. They, they took the view that what really mattered were, under, were the economic relationships and everything else would, would result from those. So if Marx uh, took the view that abolishing private property would end exploitation, uh, they took the view that restoring private property would, was the key to establishing democracy. And, the, and in both cases, the processes would be automatic because history was determinist. Uh, it, of course, didn't work that way. Uh, Russia needed more than anything else the establishment of the rule of law and, and the kind of eth ethical uh, practices that are the, an in, indispensable concomitant of a law-based state and basis for it. Uh, <clears throat> in the absence of that, what happened was uh, the young reformers embarked on the largest transfer of property uh, in a peaceful transfer of property in history, as far as we know. And uh, they did so without the guidance of law, without the guidance of, 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 of ethics. And what they got was complete criminalization. Uh, that uh, the transition from, from communism to, ca to, to, to market capitalism uh, took a detour and what was created was gangsterism. The, uh, 
the consequences for the Russian people were so devastating that uh, it seemed all but uh, impossible that Yeltsin or anyone connected to Yeltsin could remain in power after two, the year 2000 when there were elections. But as we know, uh, apartment buildings were blown up uh, in the middle of the night. Hundreds of innocent people were killed. The bombings were blamed on Chechen rebels. Uh, they were the excuse for the launching of a new war uh, against Chechnya, a new invasion of Chechnya. Initial success boosted the popularity of the newly appointed Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, a, a colorless bureaucrat that no one had ever heard of. And uh, Putin was elected president to the surprise of many. His first act in office was to pardon Yeltsin for all crimes committed while he was uh, president. And he launched uh, the fourth and most recent uh, phase in Russia's uh, modern history, uh, which was the, the period of explicit non-communist dictatorship but authoritarian rule is marked by provocation, assassination, crimes such as the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, but also, and we must, must you know, for, for point this out, you know, unprecedented prosperity for Russia because the, 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 the capitalist, the market institutions that were created during the period of gangsterism, on, of uh, open, open gangsterism, uh, under now we have gangsterism as a system, were uh, but those but but nonetheless market institutions were created and in the two thousands the world experienced a raw materials boom, of 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 which Russia was the leading beneficiary. The combination of those factors, create we, uh, was of immense use to Putin, and the Putin leadership because it inspired an economic boom. And to this day, uh, uh, Russians support Putin in part because of the transformation uh, in, the life, in the economic life of the country over which he presided. The moral issue of how he came to power, how he maintains power, what he intends to do in the future, and how much freedom he intends to allow Russians, those issues uh, were, were pushed aside in the, by, uh, by the spectacle of, at last, the long-awaited prosperity that began to affect people in Russia. So today we have a country which, although not rich, uh, is better off than uh, it has been historically in economic terms, uh, which is not free, but where the uh, control of the population is mostly the result of manipulation, backed up with selective terror, but not mass terror. Uh, but uh, a country which nonetheless has a, syst a, a, a type of government that is uh, too archaic uh, for the educated population uh, over, which it, uh, over which it rules, and um, which uh, has a mentality that is a potential and present danger for the rest of the world because it really, whether it engages in mass killing or not, it, it holds to the notion that murder is a, ne a normal part of political life, a normal way of settle, settling, settling quarrels and resolving disputes. And, uh, is determined to preserve itself uh, and, 
and to undermine the West as a threat uh, to its own existence uh, because of the way and because of the values on which it, it operates. So that's uh, the story uh, that is reflected in, in this book uh, that I've compiled of my essays and articles the kind of chronicle of my experiences. And uh, my hope is we're now going to have a fifth chapter, but I want the fifth chapter to be different from the four preceding chapters. And my view is that what Russia really needs and needs desperately is a, a truth commission. It needs the truth about the communist period, which has been buried. But it needs the truth about the post-communist period, including a, a, a incidents like critical incidents like the blowing up of the buildings in 1999 that allowed Putin to come to power. And then uh, on the basis of the truth, it needs a new constituent assembly. I mean, students of history, of whom there are fewer and fewer these days, I'm sorry to say, uh, uh, know that the, uh, the Bolsheviks broke up, the, cons the uh, agitated for the constituent assembly. And when it convened, they allowed it to meet for one day because there was not a, a uh, 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 because they were a, a, a minority in the Constituent Assembly, which was to d determine the new political system of the country. Russia never really recovered from that. Uh, everything that ha happened afterward reflected that, that critical event when, when, when the, uh, those who'd been freely elected from all parts of the country to determine the country's future were dispersed. When there needs to be a new constituent assembly capable of endowing Russia with a genuinely democratic system based on a real separation of power and with an awareness of the country's history. Under those circumstances, the fifth chapter may well be different than the previous four. At least that's what I'm, that's my, my hope for this country to which I've been connected over for so many years. But David, would the culture allow for that? I believe it would uh, because of my, my, in part because of what I've seen over the years. I would have never thought that, that, that Russia could uh, rid itself of communist ideology. It was so fundamental to the Soviet Union and to the way in which people lived and thought. And yet, uh, it was discarded. And what, will, what, what we have now is not, com not Marxism, Leninism, which after all was a false religion and, and functioned as one. I don't think that <clears throat> my life experience convinces me uh, that the same person uh, can have a radically different uh, view of the world and of himself in different, in a different situations. I am presently writing a history of Russia after the fall of communism, and I'm recounting an in incident that occurred uh, with, in my life when I was approached by, by a... Uh, uh, a per person who was working as a security analyst for Gazprom, the big gas conglomerate. And he introduced himself, and, and I, I in turn introduced myself, and he said, well, you don't have to introduce yourself. I know everything about you. Uh, and it turned out that he was the head, he was the, he, he was a KG, former KGB colonel who had been responsible for he, he had worked in counterintelligence and he'd been responsible for monitoring the activities of Western correspondents, including me. And so he had been following everything I did uh, th throughout the six year period when I was a correspondent in Moscow for the Financial Times. And he began recalling the incidents and so on that he had <laughs> overheard, listened, seen. And, uh, but, but here's what was interesting. Uh, at that point, I was, this was the, the Yeltsin period, and I was writing a book on the, on the rise of the Russian criminal state. And he had become a liberal. He had not only, but be, when he was involved in counterintelligence, he was involved 
in the uh, in apprehension of a man named Alexander Agorodnikov, who was a, a CIA agent uh, were, you know, in the uh, Russian foreign ministry. And Agorodnikov, uh, when after his arrest, committed suicide. He took poison. Uh, so he, uh, this man, his name was Stanislav Le uh, Lekarev, uh, he had a, you know, a history of, of working uh, on behalf of the regime, catching those who had, in theory, betray either betrayed it or were working to undermine it in the case of Western correspondents. You would have thought that this would be a, a, a real hardcore uh, nationalist uh, and uh, communist. Nothing of the kind. Uh, he was, you know, one, given the opportunity, he was a liberal. And he, he was actually an active critic of the security services. And it was in his new role that, in fact, he wanted contact with me. Of course, he remembered me from, from the period when he was spying on me. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, a person under one circumstances, under one set of circumstances, uh, is one person. A person under a different set of circumstances is often a different person. The, uh, it's, like, it's the same, a little bit the same <clears throat> with a, with, in, in a, because of my travels I've experienced this as well, uh, with a place. Uh, the same place at a different time is a different place. Uh, and I think that the, the Russian people need to be liberated from a, uh, a web of illusion and, so, and, and self, of deception and self-deception. But there's the Truth Commission you were calling for. This is what's so important. And there are a large number of Russians now who are living abroad who, who could play an important role in this. The, the emotional base of the uh, authoritarian regime is not unchallengeable. It is not invincible. Uh, for one thing, I, I, I've, I've long been convinced that the truth about the apartment bombings and how Putin came to power is critical to Russia's future and could have an important effect. Even it, people are not so cynical as to dismiss a crime law of that magnitude. But uh, of course, uh, none of this is likely to be easy. And there's a role f for the United States, which the, we've historically not been able to play. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Russians abroad. <clears throat> a good friend of mine who was a neighbor was a Russian physicist. Mm -hmm. His father was the conductor of a Soviet army orchestra. Uh, obviously, he grew up an atheist. There was no mention of God in his house. Um, now he has, in the past several years, converted to Russian Orthodoxy. He's going back to Russia to find the graves of his relatives who disappeared in the gulag and would describe the profoundly moving experience that was. So he's sort of a one-man truth commission. The thing is though, and, and that's what's so profoundly moving about your work, David, is that you, when, you're, when you are over there, and it's not a surprise you've been kicked out. You are, you are basically forcing them to face the situation, to face the past, by your own trips to those grave sites and your <clears throat> own interviews with the people who are still alive when, when they were utilized and asking them what they thought was going on there and if they participated, how they rationalized this. So no wonder you were thrown out.
They don't, they don't want no, that No, they don't. They don't. And the, the, the other thing, the other problem that we face here is the, 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 the superficial mindset of the West. Uh, there is, I mean, we, we talk about the reluctance of Russians to face the truth. But there's a reluctance in the West, there's a reluctance in the U.S. Uh, to face the truth as well. It doesn't, it doesn't derive necessarily from a fear of, the, of personal consequences so much as an unwillingness to think outside of a familiar, comfortable, and a conventional framework. Uh, I'm often uh, discouraged by the reluctance of Western political figures and uh, intellectuals uh, to simply draw the obvious conclusions. So it's not Russians alone, uh, but de definitely the, we saw how important uh, the truth can be uh, during the Glasnost period. It was powerful enough to demolish the Soviet state. It's powerful enough now to help the Russian people uh, embark on a new direction uh, and, and a better direction for their future. But there have to be people who, are, who really who appreciate that and are committed to it. Well, as you well know, Navalny is in prison and apparently uh, <clears throat> in pain and not receiving adequate medical treatment. This is the latest news, yeah. So he's, he's uh, exhibit A that they're, they're not going to allow precisely what you're calling for. Yes, and, and I've, I, uh, my only concern as far as Navalny is, uh, is concerned is that uh, his emphasis on corruption uh, although uncomfortable regime for the regime, doesn't reach the the, the fundamental level of values because uh, what's at stake in Ru the, the problem in Russia is not uh, corruption, it's murder, uh, and it's uh, an attitude toward human life and toward the value of the individual, which of course, corruption corruption is a symptom. Corruption is a symptom that arises from this mentality of the of the interchangeability of people of their lack of of their lack of of, of genuine worth. Uh, what, that is that is ultimately what has to be addressed. Of course, uh, Navalny's uh, videos. His he's an ex he is a superb investigative journalist, by the way, uh, and his videos uh, are very effective. Uh, in showing the the symptoms of the underlying disease, from but from where are they going to derive this value of the individual person? I think that 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 of course it requires leadership. It of course requires uh, the readiness t uh, to face the truth. There have been those people even in the post-Soviet period, who have appeared uh, and have, uh, one of them was my, my good friend, Yuri Shekhachikhan, uh, who, uh, and, and there was Anna Politkovskaya, the investigative journalist who was murdered. Uh, there, were, there, were, there, there, are, there are people there, I mean, uh, not all of them are internationally famous. So a lot of them are not famous even in Russia itself. But, but the, uh, uh, we don't know who, who will be the protagonists of, of, uh, of such a movement, but uh, it's necessary, it can exist, uh, the conditions for its emergence exist. Uh, right now, uh, the a lot of the opposition activity is uh, directed toward the uh, exposing corruption, which is okay. It's not not uh, 
not a fundamental challenge to the regime, but there are pe there are people, that, and I know them. I can, I I, I know their names who are, who are, who are capable of addressing. I mean, Andre Sakharov, of course, did, but uh, addressing Russia's problems at the at the level at which they they are that 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 they are posed by history, but. Solzhenitsyn. Well, of course. Before I ask you what, what, how Solzhenitsyn is thought of today, give me your reaction to President Biden recently agreeing to the characterization of Putin as a murderer. Well, I think that, 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 that uh, he was right to do so. Uh, it was a very hesitant. He, he basically responded to a question. Right. And we have to remember that when a similar question was posed to President Trump, uh, uh, Trump uh, said, "Well, we kill a lot of people too." It was a, a, a one of one of the worst statements uh, made by an American president. But um, it's meaningless without specifics. And the specifics exist. In fact, Biden is not the first American political figure to make this statement. Hillary Clinton also said this, but she wasn't president at the time. Senator Rubio said it. Uh, various other people have made this statement, always without specifics, always in the style of kids in a playground calling each other names. And it's interesting that Putin, in responding to uh, Biden's remarks, said, "Well, you know, uh, you know, as we say in the, as Russian school children say, you're calling me what you are. Uh, so it has to be, it has to go beyond this. I, in fact, uh, have wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal in which I gave the specifics uh, and the most important, uh, the the murder of Boris Nemtsov." the shooting down of the Malaysian airline or the blowing up of the buildings. But th those, are, those were three outstanding examples, but there, there, are, um, there are others. I mean, uh, Amer American journalism doesn't do uh, anything that requires real, you know, uh, real penetration, real thought. Uh, I mean, they will repeat uh, you know, crazy, unsubstantiated rumors or, or uh, anonymous reports about uh, the collusion of the Trump campaign with, um, with Russian intelligence. But when it comes to, you know, reporting on real crimes where there's real information and they're real sources, they're not able to do that. It's, it, this is, we're getting to, we get to the, uh, what we were saying earlier about certain things being outside their frame of reference and basically over their heads. Uh, and they don't want to make the effort uh, to, to bring the truth uh, about uh, the Russian regime uh, in all of its sordid detail uh, to the American people and to people in Russia as well. But David, where does that lead? One head of state calling another head of state a murderer, or in laying out the specifics of what those murders have been, which you, you have done so well. Uh, in terms of a foreign policy, where, where does that lead the United States? You know there's been um, criticism for, for uh, President Biden having agreed with the remark of murderer, and some of it runs along the line of, well, you just you just pushed uh, Putin and Russia further into the arms of President Xi because he has nowhere else to go. So he's deepening his strategic and military partnership with the PRC. Uh, I think that the the value of raising these issues is to deter Russia from further crimes uh, and also f f in a uh, same thing with objecting to the seizure of Crimea, defending those international standards that are necessary for stability. I wouldn't overestimate 
the extent to which uh, speaking the truth to the Russian leaders pushes them in one direction or another. They're well aware of the truth. It, it, the recent report, I don't know if it's been substantiated, substantiated that Russia, there's a Russian military buildup on Ukraine's border. That may, that, that, that may well be, but it, it, was, it was not because of anything that Biden said. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have to be careful uh, about what we assume are the causal links. Uh, the Russians, you know, in Russia there's a, there's a proverb which very well, uh, in fact, it's, I actually like it in some ways, but it very well expresses their attitude. It is, a dog barks, but the caravan continues. And uh, Russians are very good at distinguishing between uh, verbal statements and uh, concrete actions. The, uh, they understand, however, that uh, you know, when those verbal statements are, are more than just words, but reflect real, uh, real knowledge, uh, they begin to resemble concrete actions and become a factor in the power relationship between the countries. Uh, the, it is to the advantage of the United States uh, to define the relationship with Russia. Once defined, they aren't going to take revenge on us uh, for doing what they know themselves uh, any self-aware country would do. Uh, but they, would ra they will rather uh, adapt to our conditions. And uh, it's the same with uh, anything else that, uh, that, uh, that develops in the relationship between Russia and the rest of the world. Uh, they, they, they will not turn to China uh, because uh, you know, we demonstrate to them that we won't tolerate or we're not going to uh, encourage their illegal behavior. They will moderate their illegal behavior or at the very least attempt to camouflage it. Uh, they will, they will, they, if they turn to China, it will be for completely different reasons. If they mass troops on the, on the Ukrainian border, uh, the uh, strong statements by the U.S. Uh, that indicate that we actually know the kind of regime that exists in Russia and we know the facts about their crimes will deter uh, to the extent it's possible uh, aggression against Ukraine just as much as the provision of military support and political support. Uh, they, um, we don't drive them into aggressive behavior by resisting it. Uh, on the contrary, uh, we make it clear to them that they have nothing to gain. You, you made the interesting remark characterizing the period under the Soviet Union when people obviously were not living very well, but they took pride in this fact that we were afraid of them. Now, even the whole world. The whole world was afraid of them, even uh, now with a, a better standard of living. As you know, Russia is, is an economy of, of about the size of Italy's. However, they have modernized their nuclear forces. They have some first class military equipment. Um, they've reformed their military. Um, and uh, their incursions into the NATO airspace, their nuclear submarines uh, poking through the ice cap in the Arctic, um, <coughs> their, their activities in Libya, Syria, the Mediterranean, uh, they are, how does that resonate in Russia today? Are, are Russians 
Same way. Enjoying the, it. The, the same they, way. That, so that still plays well. Same way. When the Russians developed a, 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 a supersonic missile, yeah. uh, I got a call from a Russian newspaper. I usually don't talk to them, but they have my telephone number, so they... I mean, I talk to them, but I don't don't give an interview. I, I I'm polite, of course, but uh, and they said, well, is this going to uh, compel the U.S. to treat Russia with more respect? <laughs> I said, well, I have nothing to do with <laughs> uh, whether Russia is treated with more respect. If Russia wants to be treated with more respect. It should behave in a manner that it inspires respect. So, David, you mentioned they, they still enjoy this prospect through uh, the significant military power they, they possess of uh, provoking fear in the West and uh, what, of the United States. And certainly you can say Putin has, has played his hand very well in gaining leverage in various places where the United States has neglected its traditional role or other players in the West. Now, I wanted to ask you a larger question about Russian culture. In this book, you do make reflections upon ideology, and you were a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford after going to the University of Chicago, and I was fascinated to learn that you wrote your thesis on the great and famous Hannah Arendt and her fabulous work in the 20th century on the origins and the nature of ideology. I mean, I, without that background, could you have seen so deeply as you have uh, into the Soviet Union and how that ideology so thoroughly shaped and infected that country? That's an interesting question. I've asked myself the same question because I wrote, I was at Oxford I wrote the thesis uh, on the work of Hannah Arendt, her theory of totalitarianism, and then I ended up in the uh, Soviet Union and saw it all firsthand. But in fact, uh, in my personal case, my views were also the result of a kind of evolution within my own family, because my I came from a family of people who were absolutely sympathetic toward the Soviet Union. Uh, they were, uh, my uh, father was a delegate to the 1948 uh, convention of the Progressive Party in Philadelphia, where Henry Wallace was nominated for the presidency. And uh, he subscribed to left-wing uh, periodicals. I grew up reading them like the National Guardian which uh, was at one time, you know, it was actually very well done, and I was fascinated by it as a child. Uh, we lived in a neighborhood where there were many people who were either admitted or not admitted members of the Communist Party uh, on the west side and south side of Chicago. Uh, the, we, we attended events at Hull House uh, in Chicago, the Jane Addams Center, uh, where there were, you know, which was a gathering place for left-wing groups. Uh, uh, there was a bookstore in Chicago called the Modern Bookstore, which sold, uh, you know, thinly disguised or not even not disguised Soviet propaganda. And uh, the um, uh, in 1961 was the 22nd Party Congress, in which, and my I, my own father. <clears throat> I asked him as a, as a young kid, what about these reports of slave labor camps? And he said that uh, if they had really, that this was just an attempt to discredit the Soviet Union, if there had really, those camps had really existed, that um, we would have had information, we would have had witnesses, survivors, and so on. He, uh, he, he, horribly underestimated the repressive possibilities. 1961, and Khrushchev made his, his remarks uh, about especially the 22nd Party Congress, not in, even more than during the 20, that there had been millions of victims. 
And uh, you know, my father was totally shocked uh, by this news. And he didn't, uh, <clears throat> didn't deny it and didn't justify it and began a process of reevaluation. Uh, but unfortunately, he died in 1965. But I can, that process, in my case, continued with my reading. So already, by the time I had, had you know, uh, gotten to Oxford, uh, I already had, uh, was already moving in that, the, the, the direction that, that would, of course, be greatly amplified by the, by the work on the work of Hannah Arendt, and then going, then as a, as, as a young graduate student at Oxford, traveling to the, uh, to the communist bloc and seeing the conditions firsthand and then going there and realizing that this was exactly what Arendt said it was, was an, a, a diabolical attempt to impose a false reality by force on a helpless population. So, I mean, in my per personal case, there was a, a process of, of, of uh, which in fact is, existed for a lot of people. Uh, you know, and I read Arthur Kessler, uh, The God That Failed, uh, and the, uh, the, the, which was, is still one of the great books uh, of, written by ex-communists who, and, and in fact, you know, you have to be able to get into the idea to understand its evil. Uh, and as, as, as I once told someone, he said, to, to understand the weakness of communism, you first of all have to understand its strength. And uh, those who, who were never attracted to it in any way have a tough time penetrating that that very that very you know special mental universe. You you point out and and you you have a very uh, illuminating discussion in here about Nazism and communism and comparing the two forms of millenarianism. Hitler, the new messiah, the the class. Uh, is replaced by race. Um, the Jews and the Gypsies become the new bourgeoisie that has to be eliminated, and the Slavs enslaved, etc. Now, here here's a larger question again about Russian culture. <clears throat> Before the revolution in 1917, <clears throat> there was a, a an idea. Uh, in Russia, of it as the third Rome. Yeah, absolutely. And it had a special a providential, and maybe even messianic mission to play in the world. And many, you know, there were, as you well know, during the Cold War, there were analysts who simply said, look, uh, don't pay so much attention to communism, it's just an overlay on the traditional Russian character, uh, which has these geopolitical interests and plus is animated by this idea of itself, this messianic idea of itself. So, it, it, you know, just deal with it in that way and don't pay attention to the ideology. And then, of course, you had, and they would therefore say there's really something fundamentally wrong with the Russian character. It, it doesn't matter in, in which current expression it takes itself, you see. Um, maybe Richard Pipes was a bit in that direction in his analyses. That, yeah. Uh, but then you'd have, of course, <clears throat> Russians themselves, Solzhenitsyn, saying, no, no, it's not something fundamentally wrong with the Russian character. It's this ideology that's, that's evil. This is the great, the great debate in Russia itself uh, between these, these camps. Um, was was the communist regime a logical expression of Russian history, uh, or was it something different? And and uh, the uh, and um, I think both are correct. I think that the uh, 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 you know the uh, the the drive to combine theory and practice and to impose an idea. Uh, uh, 
and combine religious and political authority. Uh, this is uh, this has its roots in Russian history, but the the absolutely amoral and even diabolical quality of the communist ideology, when it you know imposed on that foundation, set the stage for you know the mass slaughter not just in Russia and the Soviet Union, but in the countries that were affected by it as well. I mean, we see countries where you didn't have that historical background, but where nonetheless the, 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 the atrocities were, were, no, were, were also horrific. Okay. Uh, and this is important to bear in mind, and that even, and with, because the, the, the communist expression, the denial of, 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 of the spiritual beginning in a person, uh, the utter denial, uh, that, that set the stage for the mass atrocities that followed and made them even logical, by the way. And, that, and we, we deal with that residue today. I, well, growing up in Chicago, if we want to go back you know, to sort of family history and, 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 and the past, uh, I can rem I have memory as a child of being absolutely irritated and angered by uh, religious broadcasts on Sunday morning, which got in the way with of the cartoons that they used to show on. And and and. And the and people who I consider totally uneducated, prattling on and on about dialectical materialism, and the evils of dialectical materialism, and if there was anything that made me sympathize with the Soviet Union as a young kid, it was listening to the to these 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 uh, sermons uh, Sunday morning on Chicago television about. The evils of dialectical materialism, the, how it was reflected in communism in the Soviet Union. And my early impression was that these were the, the biggest idiots that ever existed, the people who were, who were you know, conveying these, these, uh, uh, you know, these ideas. So what happens? You know, I go to Oxford, I study... Uh, Hannah Arendt, write a thesis, or go to the Soviet Union, understand that the essence of the Soviet system is the ideology. I study the ideology, start reading everything I can, and what do I, real, what do I come up with? That the source of the evil is dialectical <laughs> materialism. And so I thought, and I thought well, <laughs> they were right after all. So it's, I mean, and this goes back to a question you posed, Bob, is can people change? Um, can the Russian people change? Can they look at things in a different way? And, uh, you, know, I, I've, you know, I've seen it even in my own life that, that, that uh, the same person you know, with information, with experience, can change his views. And, uh, and in fact, we're, let's face it, we are all products of our information environment. I mean, even, even, the, even the, most, the most informed among us. Well, that, that, that raises an <clears throat> interesting question. What, what is the information environment in Russia now? What, what are they getting? They're not getting what they should be getting. The, the, uh, the, the press inside Russia, uh, they want to, the, the, the Putin regime is clever. They want to give the impression of vigorous opposition activity. And so they tolerate a certain amount, but there are taboo subjects that you can't, you really can't touch. And if somebody tries, I mean, they can, they can pay with their lives. Uh, it's not the, the manufacture of an entire false version of reality as existed during the Soviet period. Nonetheless, the, you know, those things that, and of course, there's on, on the other, other, other side, there's massive pro 
government manipulation and propaganda, the use of television. And of course, they know their own people very well. They know. Fact is, when the Soviet Union fell, a psychological vacuum was created in the lives of many people. They lost the ideology that had given meaning to their lives. And more important, they lost the sense that they were part of something great. And uh, anyone, one of the reasons that Putin is popular is that he has been adept at playing on that, that feeling of, of loss, uh, loss of empire, loss of status, uh, and even if it's only on a, in a very limited way, restoring to people some of the sense that they're part of a great power. And that's, uh, that's something that we need to bear in mind. And we need, you know, if we want to influence them, we have to show them that they're, that they're getting something in return for what they lose. Uh, they may lose that sense of being part of a great power of threatening the rest of the world, but they, they gain a sense of individual dignity. And that's, that's the message that the West needs to convey. That's the message that the U.S. needs to convey to Russia. Well, it's what we don't often succeed in doing. Russia had a great culture. It has a great culture. I mean, at the... At the <clears throat> Late 19th century, early 20th century, you can speak of a, a great cultural renaissance in Russia. It was an astonishing period of creativity in literature, in music, in philosophy. Uh, I, I can remember even having conversations with senior Soviet people, including a member of the Politburo, and I, if I would delve into Russian literature and Russian music, they would light up. And that's all they wanted to talk about. Well, this and is a country... There's so much to be proud of, and it's, there, there is so much talent and potential there if they can be regrounded in exactly what that made that possible. And I don't know uh, today if in Russia's education uh, that it instills any any pride in that you know bob i want to i just want to point out a paradox to you that um e even during the soviet pe period there were tremendous cultural achievements oh yes uh and it's a the paradox is the following that uh it's exactly that sense of of, uh, of, of danger, of oppression, of, of uncertainty about fundamental values that generates creativity. I mean, I think that one of the problems we have in the United States today, why we see really a kind of diminishing level uh, you know, of, uh, of culture in our universities uh, and um, in our uh, in our newspapers, in, in our public life, uh, even our political life. I mean, I thought it was not particularly high before, but, but, but what we're seeing now is just shocking. And uh, it partially, it's the, the uh, partially uh, be, because of, it's a product of a world at peace, by and large. Uh, the fact that the, that the sense of danger has receded, the, dan the possibility of war, I mean, a country, you want to be at peace, but you always want in a society to be aware that the country could face, a, you know, a, a danger and, yeah. and, 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 and therefore, you know, standards count. I, I, I think we may be returning to that sense of danger today. Many people see the danger coming from Russia, uh, <clears throat> Many more see it coming principally from the PRC. Uh, well, we maybe if that may be the case. May be the case. I mean, the whether it will generate the kind of reaction you're pointing to, uh, in which we recollect ourselves and return to the, those transcendent principles that made this place possible, remains to be seen. 
But David, I'm afraid that we've, we've run out of time. And I would like to thank you very much for this, for mm -hmm. your remarks and this conversation. And I can't recommend uh, more highly all of David's writings, uh, and especially this, this extraordinary tour through 40 years of his experiences uh, in the Soviet Union and then in Russia. Never Speak to Strangers and other writings from Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, David, thank you again. Uh, thank you for joining us at the Westminster Institute. Please uh, Google us, go to the Westminster Institute website and you'll see offerings of uh, lectures and publications. Uh, and I hope you'll jo join us again in the future. Thank you.